Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor Sa, dear Prices Mücke, dear Senator Brosta, dear members of the Handelskammer, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very warm welcome to you. A lot which I wanted to say has already been said, which is my fate of the third speaker <laughs> of every evening. But there still remains a few points which I would like to make and which sort of outlines uh, the history of, as I see it, of this event and also the, the topic and, and the way uh, we want it to go uh, forward. Um, it's the inaugural event of what we call Hamburg's post-colonial uh, uh, of, of Hamburg's post-colonial lectures, and we would like to thank, or I would like to thank, for the generous support the Chamber of Commerce has given us in the person of Mrs. Lutz Herting and Mrs. Enstrom, with whom we cooperated, the President Vice Mücke and the former President Tobias Bergmann without whom probably this event would not have taken place. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much also to the team at the Forschungsstelle, Kim Totsi, Julian Zulagi, Miriam Gröpel and Marianne Weiss, who worked uh, with me, or they worked, as it's normally, and I sort of told them what to do. And <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they have credit, you should take credit for the event. If everything goes smoothly, that is, is there. Uh, that was their job. And so, thank you very much. Um, I think the first post-colonial lecture couldn't take place at a better place and not at a better time. And of course, it's hardly possible to imagine a better speaker than Professor Sam. It couldn't be a better place because Humboldt's Chamber of Commerce stands like few other institutions in Germany, if not in Europe, for international and global trade, for exchange of goods. Together with the port of Hamburg, it really makes Hamburg the gate to the world. There is no better place in Hamburg to reflect on the future of processes which we summarize under the heading of globalization. Globalization, however, is contrary to the perception of many, not a phenomenon of the present or of the last 10 or 20 years. It's not a phenomenon without the history. Post-colonial globalization, as it should be better termed, has a history, and this history is the history of colonization. We witness currently, and for the last decades, the change from the colonial to post-colonial globalization. And we in Hamburg, in Germany or in Europe will only be able to make the right decisions for the future if we know about this history, if we stop ignoring this history. William Faulkner said, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Nowhere is this truer than with regards to colonial history. In Hamburg, and well beyond the confines of the city, the Handelskammer is a key colonial, or rather post-colonial, site of memory. It is from here, from this institution, if not the building, as has already been mentioned, that the former presses, president of the Chamber of Commerce, Adolf Wehrmann, wrote to the Chancellor of the German Empire and urged him to, in the name of the merchants of Hamburg and of Germany, to declare certain colonies, certain territories in Africa, official German colonies, areas where he and his colleagues had commercial interests. In 1884-85, Togo, Cameroon, German Southwest Africa, today's Namibia, and German East Africa, today's Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi, became German colonies, as well as some possessions in the Pacific and slightly later on in China. It would be wrong and ahistorical to overemphasize this letter by Vermont and its influence. Hamburg merchants' interests were not the only reason for Bismarck's decision, nor were they perhaps the most important ones. However, one should also not downplay the role of the Chamber of Commerce 
and the traders, merchants and shipping lines. The individual letter might have been not that important. The role trading interests played in the process of colonization certainly was. The Chamber of Commerce stands for a perspective beyond the German colonies to the colonial globalization as interaction with the colonial world as such. Hamburg claims to have been Germany's gate to the world, or still to be it. This world was up to the 1960s a, a colonial world. world. One traded with colonies, with colonial powers, recently independent colonies. One bought, shipped and sold colonial goods and sometimes people. And one is, as I already mentioned, now caught in the process of post-colonial globalization. The European dominance is gone, once and for all. And the larger Western dominance, the United States basically, will soon follow. For all this, the Chamber of Commerce can stand, can use its history to point to the future. And this is what this lecture is about. I think it's very promising that years after colonial amnesia and denial, we are finally in a dialogue with each other, the scholars and the Chamber of Commerce, the civil society and the Chamber of Commerce. I hope we can make this a continuing process. This lecture, SARS lecture, not mine, could hardly come at a better time. There is, for one, the ongoing debate, which has already been mentioned, on how to deal with colonial legacy in German museums. The discussion surrounding the Humboldt Forum comes to mind. This debate currently concentrates on colonial objects which have been stolen and brought to Europe, where they form key pieces of the collections which we are so proud of, being the dinosaur in Berlin, Museum of Natural History, being the Benin process, etc., etc. Our speaker, as you undoubtedly know, has already played a key role in moving this debate along. However, what has the debate on colonial loot to do with the Chamber of Commerce? As far as we know, there are no looted objects here. However, the colonial objects and how we deal with them stand for the wider question how the relationship between Europe and non-European areas, countries, continents changed or should change. This goes well beyond museums and cultural policy. It is about a new ethic of relations. The German Minister of Defense, Annegret kramp karrenbauer has as recently as last week demanded that Germany should have a National Security Council after the US example to streamline all policy fields which is security relevant. In this context, she named German development policy as one of the fields in need of streamlining. Rarely has, been, has it been said so openly that development or development aid uh, is, has nothing to do with aid nor with development. It is an echo of, old, of an old colonial mindset that we Europeans engage in Africa to our benefit and according to our interest. However, is development policy, development cooperation really best understood in terms of German security concerns? Or is this focus not part of the problem? It is, it is global social justice that is needed, not short-sighted securitization of development policy, if I use the contested term developmental for the moment. Don't we have to radically rethink our relations with the world outside Europe if we want to become fit for the 21st century? That is at stake, in my opinion, at the debate about the colonial legacy. It is about the past, but it's much more about the future. This is all part of the discourse about colonial legacy, about restitution and about recognition of colonial genocide, apology and reparation. This is not memory politics, or not only memory politics. It is about the future 
of a global world and in a globalized world. We couldn't have found a better speaker than Professor Felvin Saar because he embodies in his work all those aspects like nobody else. A professor of economics and humanities, I think, I don't know whether that's the official title, but that's what he told me, what he's basically doing. When I said, oh, it's interesting to meet an economist with this wide uh, interest, he said uh, that he is combining both, that that is what he want, is doing uh, at his university uh, in St. Louis, Senegal. And he's widely known as a writer and as a musician. So we could have also have a concert today, but we decided <laughs> to go for a lecture. Next time we could have a, have, have, have a concert. And he wrote together with Benedict de Savoie the famous, the by now famous restitution report for the French president, Macron, published in 2018. In this document, they convincingly laid out how many objects in French museums were actually acquired during colonialism, and they argue for a process, a swift process of restitution and an open discussion about this. And I think it's not possible to overemphasize the importance of this report. It opened the door and nobody will be able to close this door again. It's put the discussion on colonial objects, on colonial loot on a, uh, an entirely new level. Together with uh, uh, Professor Achille Membe, Professor Saar founded Le Atelier de la Pensée, an atelier in, Sen in, in, Sen in Dakar, an atelier or a space for thinkers and thinking in which African intellectuals meet and develop their own ideas and concepts, also in response to the epistemic dominance of the Western world, or not in response, as a reaction, as a counterpoint to the epistemic dominance of the Western world, which in itself is a, resu a result of colonialism, is a colonial legacy. The Süddeutsche Zeitung on Saturday brought a detailed article about the last uh, me meeting, which took place last week. And uh, I all recommend you to read this article to see what an uh, inspiring work is going on. In this line of thinking, one could also situate his book, Afrotopia, in which he <coughs> develops some of his ideas about true African political and intellectual independence, a manifesto for a truly decolonized Africa, which won him many prizes. It is this topic which we thought would be most fitting for today's event and also for the Chamber of Commerce. Please welcome with me Professor Felvin Saar for the first Hamburg post-colonial lecture on his, the topic Africa, Europe, rethinking the ethics of relations. I would like to start by saying my pleasure to be here in Hamburg and I want to thank Professor Jürgen Zimmer and all the organizers of this event for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to be part of this conversation on post-colonialism here in Germany. I want also to thank Vice President Mucke and Senator Brosda for their preliminary words and also Professor Zimmer for your kind introduction. These last five centuries, Europe had played a critical role in the dynamics of African, Asian, and American countries, both North and South, by being an hegemonic power, shaping more or less the political, economic, and cultural dynamics of those countries. The relations between the African continent and Europe are ancient. They are mainly the result of the European imperialism that began at the 15th centuries and ended up with colonialism. Between the mid 19th centuries and the mid 20th centuries, almost all the entire African continent was under the European colonial rule. Not far from here, in Berlin, in 
1884, between 1884 and 1885. The African continent as a cake was shared and scrambled by Europeans. The current African nation state borders are the ones drawn by Europeans during the so called Berlin Conference. Since time has passed, most of the African countries has had recovered their political sovereignty around the 60s. But despite this fact, they are still entangled in asymmetric relations with Europe. The structure that produced this asymmetric relation was settled during colonial periods in all domains, epistemology, knowledge, economy, political relation, geopolitics, culture, etc., etc. And if you look at the current relation between Europe and African countries, they are marked by the remnants of this coloniality. In the economic domains, African countries or economies are supposed to produce raw material for at cheap prices for European industries. European enterprise or firm and now Chinese are extracting gold, coltan, and all types of minerals in mining sector of African countries without neither paying the fair part of tax to the African countries nor taking care of the harmful consequence on the environment. The amount of illicit financial flows that leaves the African continent is far beyond the public aids and the foreign direct investment in Africa. In the domains of knowledge, the hegemony of Western epistemology and its languages is undivided. Even the imaginaries of modernity are dominated by the Western vision of or version of modernity or what modernity could look like. The independence era in Africa was a moment where African countries were supposed to recover their autonomy and their ability to draw new path in economy, political and social forms, institutions. But six decades later, one has to acknowledge that Africa in the present time is experiencing a continuity of the colonial agenda. The colonial pact described previously benefit to an African political and economic elite, but also to the European nation as societies. The later, the European societies, delegate to their leaders or their government the management of the relation with other continent, but continue to benefit from these asymmetric relationships in economy, in culture, in geopolitics, without interrogating the source of their wealth and the reason of the current global dynamics, mobility, migration, ecological crisis, etc. One of the, the challenges of, for Europeans is to be able to write another history in the present by stop benefiting from an heritage based on spoliation and unfairness. This is an ancient story. European wealth of the 18th centuries was based on a primitive accumulation of capital built on African trade slaves, let's say the free work of millions of Africans enslaved during centuries. Cities like Nantes, Bristol, Liverpool or Bordeaux on the Atlantic shore and most European cities enriched themselves from the transatlantic, from the transatlantic slave trade. In writing his famous book, The Wealth of the Nation, an inquiry into the nature and the causes of the wealth of the nation in 1776, Adam Smith pointed out the division of labor and the manufacture are as key elements of the wealth of European nation. But he forgot to point it out that the primitive accumulation of capital and wealth that, allow, that was allowed by the slave trade the tied link between the development of capitalism, the slave trade, and colonialism is now well established by scholars in every domain. Talking here in Hamburg about decoloniality 
and the necessity of inventing a common world is highly symbolic of it. It has been said already. Hamburg was the Germany's foremost colonial metropolis. We consider as Germany's gateway to the world, the city of Hamburg played an important role in Germany's colonial expansion in the 19th century. In July 1883, Hamburg's Chamber of Commerce published a memorandum calling for the acquisition of colonies in West Africa. This memorandum was an, an, an essential step towards the formal colonial annexation of Cameroon, Togo, and Namibia. In Namibia, the German colonialism ended up to the first genocide of the 20th century, the genocide of the Aero and the Rinama. On 2 October 1994, German military governor Lothar von Trotter issued an extermination order. I quote, all Aero must live or die. That is my decision for the Aero people. The Aero were then wiggled off from their lands and German soldiers surrounded them and left them only one exit corridor leading to the Kalahari Desert, where they died of hunger and thirst. The Germans had taken care to poison all the water point in the desert of the Kalahari. The survivor will be interned in forced labor camp called concentration camps, and the concentration camps belongs to the German protectorate and other to the private companies such as the Woman Line, now called Dutch Africa Linen. The camps were dismantled in 98, but the former deportees were stripped of their property rights. They were obliged to wear a metal disc with their registration number around their neck. The concentrationist methods used by the German in Namibia to exterminate the Erero and the Nama were 30 years later taken up and preferred by the Nazis. In the camps, German settlers were conducting medical experiments on area of detainees under the direction of Professor Eugene Fischer. Bodies and skulls of mutilated area were regularly sent to the dissection laboratory of the University of Freiburg or Berlin. And Professor Fischer's most famous disciple who was also his assistant, was Joseph Mengele, the angel of death of the Auschwitz camp. The first civilian governor of this German colony in Southwest Africa was Heinrich Göring, the father of Hermann Göring, who is well known in Germany, in the history of Germany. So this encounters was the worst version of the relationality between Germans and Africans. M. Césaire described colonialism as an encounter with the darkest face of the other. The current entanglement of the world, the rising cosmopolitan condition of our societies, our global societies, the contemporary mobility or migrations are the result of these historical dynamics. One of the challenges we are all facing, both in the global north and the global south, is to improve the quality of the relationality between nation, continent, human, and nature. Thinking decoloniality is seeking a new quality of relationality between human groups. In March 2018, with my colleague Benedict Savoy, we were asked by the French president to write a report on the restitution of African artifacts taken during the colonial period by France in Africa. We delivered the report in November 2018. The report creates an important debate in Europe and Africa on this issue and opened the door for the restitution of artifacts of Benin by France. I will not too much insist on our result and our main methodology. They are available in the report and in the book Benedict Savoy and I have Publish, but I want to share with you some lessons that I've learned from this experience related to relationality. The issue of restitution is an entangled one. The question raised are not only limited to those of legitimate ownership of objects. The implications of the restitution are also political, 
the symbolical, philosophical, and relational. Restitution opened up a reflection on, on history, on uh, memories, on the colonial past, as well as the genesis and development of Western ethnographic museums and uh, collections. The issue also addressed the question of the different uh, conception of cultural heritage, the various, the various m m modality of display of objects, as well as their circulation or translocation. The example of African artifacts that are present in the European collection is archetypal of the nature of the relation between Europe and the African continent, and they can be used as an example to reflect on these relations. Through the question of the restitutions, I want to reflect on the necessity of reshaping relations between Europe and Africa towards what we call a new relationality. The current debate on the necessity or not to restitute African cultural heritage stolen during colonial time to African countries is interesting in that regard. A lot of arguments that have been used by the opponent to the restitution of African artifacts, the difficulty of establishing the origin of the object, the nature of the captation gesture, was it spoliation or loans or scientific missions or sales on the art market? The issue around conservation, the universality of objects that now belongs to, to humanity and no need to return them in that regard, are for me sophisticated construction of the denial. Based on a cultural arrogance and sometimes on greed, they express a refusal to dissenter oneself and one's way of looking to these questions. Furthermore, they are sometimes the result of what I call a dogmatic framework of societies, grounded in a problematic construction of alterity, elaborated during centuries. The colonialism has also affected the European identity and its collective unconscious. Colonization was first and foremost a combination of conquest of territories and spoliation of wealth, but it also aimed to capture the resources and cultural property of the colonized nations. The absence of this cultural property of the latter hindered the reconstruction of these societies from a spiritual point of view. All the human group transmit a cultural heritage through intangible and tangible archives. Society that are affected by amnesia have difficulties in building and projecting themselves into the future. A significant number of African artifacts, work of art, and objects of worship have found their way into Western museums, altering the intergenerational transmission of memory, history, and the cultural capital in African societies whose subjects have had to be built on deficient foundations. I can go through a lot of arguments explaining why it's important for African countries, especially for African youth, to recover one part of their history of creativity. Why it's important for the rebuilding of their memories, their self-esteem, and their future. One of my interests in the issue of restitutions of African artifacts is not the number of objects that are restituted or why are they present in the, in the, in the European Museum, but is the role that these objects or patrimony in a wider sense and history it can play for the young Africans in the project of rebuilding the African continent now. For me, what is actually most needed in the African spaces is a renewed imaginary of the future. The reconstruction of a self-esteem threatened by years of alienation and the ability for young Africans to inscribe themselves in a long history of creation and meaning production. The object, the artifacts, are archive of the long history of creativity in Africa. They are also texts, support of social and spiritual practice. Everyone know the crucial role they played in contemporary art history in Europe by inspiring the avant-garde, Picasso, Vlaminck, Durand, etc. The reappropriation of an important or a significant part of 
their cultural heritage by Africans, especially young African, open space for creation, imagination, and reinvention of social, economic, and political forms. But let me just reflect with you on what were the object or what are the objects in African societies. In their long history, African societies have produced original form of mediation between the spirit, the material, and the living. Furthermore, some of these artifacts were not simply objects, but active subjects. And it's by rituals that the operation of an attribution of a subjectivity to a given inanimate object is done. The object slash subject are the mediators of metamorphose correspondence within an ecosystem characterized by fluidity and circularity. In a reticular universe, objects became the operator of a relational and plastic identity where the goal is not is to participate in the world and not to basically dominate it. Suleiman Bashirdang, a Senegalese philosopher who lives in New York and teach there, showed that the African statuary cannot only be understood as a figurative or an analogical art. This statuary is the support and a vector of a philosophical and a symbolic discourse, as well as the expression of the ontology of a vital force. The objects are also reserve of imagination, as well as material manifestation of forms of knowledge. For example, some fishing nets, encodes, algorithms and fractals. The work of decoding the various forms of knowledge they conceal, as well as the, the comprehension of the episteme that have produced them, still remain largely a work to be done. When we reflect on the question of cultural heritage object, we must understand that it's not simply objects that were taken in African society, it is, but, but the creative resources, reserve of energy, reservoir of potential, force engendering alternative figures and form of reality, force of germination, <laughs> and this loss is incommensurable. The arguments of the denial, and, and there's a lot of arguments of the denial, are, as sophisticated they are, and sometimes they are very, very sophisticated, reveals the difficulty to face one's, one's history and to deal with one's heritage. It's a fundamental question, how to negotiate with one's own heritage or with the dark past of one's heritage. And I, and I know that it's a very difficult uh, question. The challenge is to recognize that if we are born in, or if we live in Europe, we inherit museums that are constituted in a large proportion by spoliation, which has deprived entire nation of the enjoyment of their material cultural heritage, which we enjoy today in the Western world. But, and it's the good news, the relation can be rebuilt differently. By returning the object, this object we indicate that their mode of appropriation was, was problematic and it's an euphemism. And that we are not perpetuating this relational modality. Justice and balance can be achieved and a new relational ethic based on mutual respect and reciprocity. Even if we are not at the origin of these facts, we have the possibility not to perpetuate it if it's proved to be unfair. This attitude can be transferred in other spaces, international relations, trade, international trade, diplomacy, military and political relations, where one is not obliged to perpetuate relation of domination and asymmetries. The question is how can we make this wisdom be shared by the political elite? Sharing patrimony, recognizing the others, but also deconstructing the structure of hegemony and asymmetries are precondition of for the creation of new relational modalities. 
our task, our common task is to build a common world for that purpose it's necessary to get rid of the epistemology of the perpetual war of the of the competition the defense of the exclusive interest of one's nation states or the civilization we believe we are part of it's necessary to enlarge the imaginary race of our belongings we first belong to the human community as a whole the restitution issue is about global justice. It's not just about to, to European or Africans. The, the historical windows that was open in Ouagadougou in November 28, in 2017, preparing the path toward the restitution of African cultural heritage object currently held in French national collections, can or could establish a new era in cultural relation between Europe and Africa. By recognizing the legitimacy of the requests made by African countries to recover a significant part or a symbolic part of their cultural heritage and their memory, while at the same time working to a better understanding about this moment of colonial history, the process of restitutions allows for the possibility of writing a new page of a shared and peaceful history where each protagonist can provide his or her fair piece of the common story. These objects, which for a life part have been ripped away from their culture of origin by colonial violence, but which were welcomed and cared for by a generation of curators in their new places and residence in Europe, from now, be within them an irremediable piece of Europe and Africa. They became, as John Piffer said, diasporas. And they became, and they have incorporated several layers or regime of meanings. They became sites of the creolization of cultures, and as a res result, they are equipped to serve as mediators of new relationality. The best approach for the restitution of African cultural objects is to establish another relational ethics. The restitution of African cultural items will therefore initiate a new economy of relation whose effects, I hope, will not be limited just to cultural spaces or those of museographical exchanges. This is the heart of the subject that concern us, the inequal distributions of African cultural heritage around the world, its beautiful presence in Western museums, and the gaps in memories as a result of the absence in Africa, and the responsibility of each and every one of us is starting up or assuring that we can work to establish more equity. The relation to other is sometimes or is often mediated by history, but history is seen as the past. And the condition of freedom is not to be, to be governed by the past, but to rewrite it in the present time. Through the disruption of all forms of relationalities that it incites, restitution prefigures a new cosmology where the reception of cultural heritage, values from another time, give away to a new relation with the world based on recognition of our mutual interdependence and the fundamental relational characters of our identities. And it's only by taking care of these relational identities that we will be able to render this world inhabitable for everyone. If we look at Europe, not as a geography, but as a symbolic entity. North America is therefore in this symbolic entity, grounded on its own consciousness of the role it plays in the world. It seems to me, unfortunately, that Europe has not deeply decided yet to deeply change its way of relating with the real countries of the so-called global south, even if there is a criticism within Europe of 
the ancient relationality, but deeply we are at the beginning of that. And to change deeply its way of relating with the country of the so-called global south, and particularly by retreating, by consciously retreating from an hegemonic power position and engaging itself in building a common world. Extractivism, cultural appropriation, asymmetric economics relation, autism, militarization of its borders are some examples of its contemporary way of relating with the other, mainly the non-European. And this is not about history or colonial history, it's about uh, contemporary relation with the non-Europeans. The relation between Europe and the Global South are, are unfortunately still marked by, by these imbalanced asymmetries, even if we are living in a post-colonial period. If you observe the contemporary reign of the, the instrumental reason and its pitfall, it's not certain that the modern reason has undertaken its own examination and self-criticism. So let me finish my lecture with an utopia I want to share with you. If you admit a co-presence of a plurality of words in the world and of historical trajectories of nations, our task is to inhabit the world and make it livable for all the people and beings. And this could be our main objective. A new way of inhabiting the world is to base it on the production of qualitative relationships between nations, actors, individuals, and with the nature. Shifting the epistemic based on a mechanist order that wants to be the master and possessor of the nature since uh, uh, Descartes, and the regime of beliefs and uh, categories based on a mythological universe of mastering, controlling, and exploiting is one of the most difficult tasks we have in this time. Changing the imaginaries of progress, redefining values around which the technical orders, example, the economic orders, are organized and ground them on social finalities that we have collectively chosen could be one of our major tasks. A new way of living the world it can be grounded on a production of qualitative relationships as a new paradigm. A civilization, a human civilization that is achieved is the one who produces re relation of quality between its co co components or members. Building not only a human society at a global scale, but a society of beings that recognize all of its member by enlarging the notion of community to the foreigners. If you accept that the other is me, so there is no foreigner, the foreigner is in the real community. The animal species, the vegetals, the ancestors, the earth, and also to the one who are not yet born with this idea of transgenerational responsibilities, the right of the future generations. And this enlarged notion of society necessitate to rethink the notion of the same, to rethink the alterity, the feeling and the narratives of belongings. And for that purpose, we need to widen the vision of the politics and rethink our way of living this world. And to achieve a qualitative civilization, including all beings, working to access to a psychology that leads us to leave the world in a non-devastating perspective. And for that purpose, it's necessary to deeply renew the imaginaries of the relation established with the being and the entities we are living with. Our humanization process is unachieved, and the progress in quality of relation we produce is the next step. We have a progress in, in technical and scientific control of the world, but a more subtle pro progress and, and a more important is the progress in the quality of the relation our civilization, our human civilization is producing. The resources of the planet, its cultural, its, its cultural capital are common good produced by the human experience in, in its totality. The simple fact of being human should allow 
to access and, and, and benefit from this common patrimony. Every human being should have access to resources that ensure his dignity on the simple basis of his belonging to the humanity. Every social, political, economic, and cultural order is sustained and reproduced by an epistemologic order. This one regulates the understanding of the world, and therefore this one regulates the subjectivities. Changing the paradigm and the epistemic order on which we ground our behaviors is a necessity in order to imagine and construct diff a different present and therefore a different future. Living the world is considering oneself as belonging to a wider space than one's ethnic group, one's nation, the continent where we are born, those who have the same color of eyes than you, or the same level of wealth. Living the world is fully inhabiting histories and culture of humanity, in plural, its geographies, wearing its multiple face and being depository of the legacy of its plural cultures. And for this to happen, it's necessary to operate or work in the space of the language and get rid of the private appropriation of spaces, places, and common patrimony that operate in our daily languages. And probably we need to produce a lexicon of a common world to escape the fragmented version of the world we are experiencing now. And living the world is also asking to oneself, with my actions, which type of world I'm contributing to? Did my gesture reproduce the condition of iniquity, domination and devastation? Or am I contributing to make this world more flourishing, more open and more livable? Thank you for your kind listening. Thank you.